last few weeks. Uh, in the second chapter, the, the chapter with Pentecost and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the, and the birth of the church, you might remember that I actually referred to the fourth chapter of Acts, talking about the boldness that the Holy Spirit creates. And so we're going to read the part that I actually read a couple of weeks ago, but we're going to focus on something different within there. There's still a lot of boldness, and we can do a whole other sermon series just on the boldness that God creates by the power of the Spirit. But we're going to start there, Acts chapter 4, and we're going to look at verse 31. Remember that, um, uh, that Peter and John had, had healed somebody, and then they were taken before the Sanhedrin and their leaders, and, and they were, you know... Uh, told not to not to be preaching in Jesus' name anymore, and, and they scolded him, and they let him go, and they come back, and all the believers are praising God. In verse 31, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possession was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, bought the money from the, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray for uh, another outpouring of your Spirit this morning. We know, Lord, that wherever two or three are gathered in your name, that you desire to fill them with the Holy Spirit, that you do that work when we open up Scripture together. And so, Father, we trust that again this morning, that you'll pour out your Spirit again, that you'll fill us with your Holy Spirit, that you'll use that Spirit to open up our hearts and minds to the truth of Scripture, that you'll use that Holy Spirit in our lives to give us a boldness, that you'll pour out your Holy Spirit once again here this morning and move us, shape us, and transform us in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, <clears throat> So like I said, I had worked on this part of the scriptures actually a couple of weeks ago. But the one verse that, that, that really God kept my heart on as I was thinking about what I was going to preach in the fourth chapter, the one verse that God kept lacing on my heart over and over again is Acts chapter 4, verse 32. The first part, all the believers were one in heart and mind. All the believers were one. Underline that. Were one in heart and mind. You see, this isn't just a, a quaint description of the early church. This isn't just some nostalgic disciples yearning for and thinking about the, the early days. Right? When we were one in heart and mind, we can see in Scripture that what's being described in Acts chapter 4 is the church, not just the first century church, but the every century church. Not just the old time church, but the all time church. One in heart of mind is not a nostalgic look back. It is who the people of God are and how they function. Amen? We are going to look at the power of unity today, where it comes from and what it does. This is not human-created, let's get along, unity, but God-centered, Holy Spirit-inspired unity. We're going to discover today that God wants to fill us so that we can be united in Him and then bring us into fellowship with one another, and the unity that God has for us is powerful, power-filled. So let's look at Scripture and see where unity comes from and how it's accomplished in us, the people of God. They were one in heart and mind. It was obviously powerful then, and it's powerful not now, to be united to others in Christ. But where does it come from? And where does it begin to be united in God? Well, let's take a look at John chapter 17, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the fourth gospel, the fourth book of the New Testament, Look at John chapter 17, and it's a, it's a chapter with a lot of red. Jesus is, is speaking in this chapter. In fact, Jesus is praying. This chapter is a prayer, and it's often called a, a, the prayer of unity, praying for his disciples. He's, he's on the verge of departing from them, and he's praying over them. But I want, to, want you to look at John chapter 17, verse 20. If you look at the, the, the title there, it says, Jesus prays for future believers. Listen to this. 
John 17, 20. My prayer is not for them alone. He's talking about the disciples that are gathered there, the disciples that are with him in the upper room. He says, my prayer is not for just them alone. He's speaking to the Father. He says, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. Well, who believes in Jesus because of their message? All of us, right? The ones who came right after them, but all who have come since then. Because we have a witness right here that we read of their, of their faithfulness, of their proclamation, of how God moved and shaped them. So Jesus says, I pray also for those who believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. This is all believers. May be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I've given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I and them, and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me, and have loved them even as you have loved me. We see two things here that I want to talk about. First, that our unity comes from Jesus. Jesus asks the Father to make us one, to unite us to him and to one another, to unite us together. All Christian unity, from the unity in Acts, the beginning of the church, to the unity here at Living Word, among believers, to the unity that I feel when I get together with Pastor Doug Wing or Robinson, Robin Knudsen, who runs the FCA. All that unity, right? With any Bible-believing evangelical Christian, it all begins here in John chapter 17, when Jesus asked the Father, unite us all. The unity that we experience is not uh, a forced upon us. Uh, and it kind of like arguing siblings with a tired parent, you know? Could you guys all just get along? That's the sort of unity that I like to call the long car trip. You know Anybody? Am I alone? Let's be nice to each other and get along because there is nowhere else to go. We are trapped in here. So get along. Christian unity is not that kind of unity. Listen to me. Christian unity, and this is key, Christian unity does not start with division. We often think of Christian unity in the light of the division that we live in within the Christian churches. And so we assume that what Jesus is praying about here kind of starts with division. And that Jesus is trying to bring us back together somehow. That is not what this is about. Listen to me here. Christian unity doesn't start with division. It starts with love. Did you hear any division in the text that Jesus is trying to deal with? And that's the second important thing that we need to see from this text. The unity is not based on division. So unite them, please, Lord, because there is division. It's based on a desire by Jesus for us to know the sort of affection and togetherness that he has with the Father. Look at the text. Do you hear how much love is in that? That text is just overflowing with grace and love. Jesus is praying that we would be united to God and that we would be united together so that, so that we could experience what they have together. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't it beautiful? Look at John 17. Look at the love that, that just that pours out of that text. So that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. That the Father would love us just like he loves his Son. Oh, it's gorgeous. Unity isn't based, based on division, it's based on love. I want them to have what we have. Connect them forever to us like we're connected because I love them. Jesus prayed to the Father asking him to unify us to God, to make us one with God, and the Father did that. The Father answered his prayer by pouring out his Spirit. God unified the disciples and he still does the unifying of Jesus' disciples, drawing them to himself that's where being of one heart and one mind starts. It starts with Jesus. But it is also about Jesus, and it's for Jesus. So let's look at the second component, the second piece of Scripture that really highlights and speaks to Christian unity, and we can find it in the second chapter of Philippians. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. The 11th book of the New Testament Philippians chapter 2. Sometimes this is called the Christ hymn. Some people think that this might be the earliest song in the church. 
earliest hymn of the church. But to Paul, Paul, let's let's read these first few verses in, in Philippians two. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, remember we just talked about that. If any comfort from His love, if any common sharing of the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete, being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Sound familiar? Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Sound familiar? Rather in, huma humil rather in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but to the interests of others in your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. You see, Paul starts that section with some, he kind of famously has these rhetorical questions. Um, if there is any encouragement from being united in Christ, and, and everybody that reads it goes, well, duh. It's not a question where you go, well, oh, I don't know, is there encouragement in Jesus? It's, Paul has these, is, is kind of famous for rhetorical questions where you go, well, of course. You see, he's leading us to an understanding. He's leading us to say, okay, if there's understanding, if there's any consolation, if there's, you know, and he brings it, then he lays this before us. If you do feel or sense this, and of course you do, then Paul says, step into it. Believe it. Claim the unity that's there. In other words, you are united. Believe it and live it. In Philippians, we see the result of being united to Jesus and the Father, and the result is that we, listen to me, we can be godly. Remember the Old Testament? Paul, uh, the Father said, Be holy as I am holy. And then we, we discovered as we walked through the Old Testament a couple of years ago, we couldn't follow through. We, God wanted a people for himself and we couldn't be holy. We fail all the time in, in following God's laws and commands. It is only by the power of Jesus Christ that work in us through the power of the Holy Spirit that we can be united to God and that we can follow through on God's call to be holy as he is holy because it is through Christ's righteousness that we are righteous. Amen? So we can be godly. We are united to God, and when we are, we turn to each other in forgiveness and love. When we are united to God, we reach out to other brothers and sisters in Christ and offer ourselves our time and our resources. Can you hear the similarities to chapter 4 of Acts when I was reading that? Did you hear when I was saying, it talked about being of one mind and of, of a heart and a mind. Then it talked about, you know, being selfless. And you can see that in the book of Acts, chapter 4, where the people were giving stuff away. They felt this just immense unity where people were just providing for each other and meeting each other's needs. There was humility. They served God in each other. Unity flowed out of them. No one was in want. Listen to me. This was not some communist redistribution of wealth. People gave as the Holy Spirit compelled them to give. That's a very different thing. When God asked, when God placed on somebody's heart, when they saw a need and they felt compelled by the Spirit to do something, they just did it. They trusted that the Lord had moved them, that they were united to God, and what God was speaking to them was drawing them to do something. Being united to God, you see, frees us to love with humility. It frees us to live in faith and to love with the same generosity and passion that Jesus loved us with. Are you awake? Paul lays out the life of a unified, united believer in verses 3 and 4, talking about that, look at that in verses 3 and 4 there of Philippians, where he talks about, um, where he talks about having, you know, nothing from selfish ambition or vain conceit, and he lays out what that looks like for us. And then he says this in 5, in your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature of God, he didn't consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. He Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, by being made in human likeness, being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. To the glory of the Father. Have the same mind in you that is in Christ, who emptied himself and who was a servant. Well, well, great, Paul. Thanks a lot. Be more like Jesus. Well, that's not too hard of a bar to set, right? <laughs> Guess what, people? Listen, 
It is possible to be more like Jesus when we are united to God. It's called sanctification. God works on our hearts and our minds. Listen to me. The closer that I get to God, the more things of my past that I once loved are reshaped. I don't love them as much. Listen, I love rock and roll radio. I got thousands of records. I love to listen to them. And once that's all I listen to. But now I hear in every song just something that kind of turns me a little bit the wrong way. And where I'm truly fed is when I just turn on some rock and roll that's got the message of Jesus. See, that's a reshaping. That's a small little way of sanctifying. But it ends up in how we treat and look at other people and how we respond to other people. Do you see this? It's called this. It's my mom saying when I was in high school, those friends aren't going to be good for you. I was a good kid. Trying to be helpful. And they affected me. When we hang out with Jesus, we get transformed. We get transformed. The more we dive into Scripture, the more we claim the truth that we through Christ are unified to God, the more that God can shape us and sanctify us and mold us to do His will, we will continue to grow in faith and look more and more like Jesus. We will step out. We will trust that we are united to God, that what God is giving us and what God is speaking into us is what God calls us to do, and we'll step out and we'll do it. We'll have faith and we'll trust. When we become more and more like Jesus, do you think that your families will get changed? <laughs> Think you'll be a better husband, better wife, better son or daughter? Do you think as we claim the unity that is ours in Christ Jesus to him, that our church will look different? Make no assumptions that because we're in church, you know, hey, when we got to be connected to the Lord. It doesn't matter what moniker you put on it. If we're not Bible-believing, Holy Spirit-desiring Christians, we'll just be a club. I don't want to be a club. Do you? I don't need another club. I don't need more to do. I need to be transformed. Amen? You think our community will be changed? See, God can use us because we, simp we're, we simply become extensions of Him. Turn to John chapter 15. A couple of, a couple of chapters earlier than John chapter 17... John chapter 15, John 15, 17 was where we found the prayer of unity. John 15, another place with a lot of red words that Jesus is speaking. John 15, 5, Jesus says this, I am the vine, you are the branch. Remember being uni unified to God, being connected to God? I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you'll bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you don't remain in me, you're like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. Fruit appears and it brings glory to the one that we are connected to, the Father. Being connected to the Father not only shapes us, but through us, God shapes others. So let's go back to Acts chapter 4 here. Acts chapter 4, where they were one in heart and mind. And I want to look at what, what that meant for them briefly here. What happened when they were connected to the vine, united to God and to each other? Well, verse 31, the beginning of what I read, says, After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Spoke the word of God boldly. What follows is that we get filled. When we're connected to the Father, we get filled. We get filled with the Holy Spirit because that's how we experience God, through God's Holy Spirit. So if we're united to Him, then we're going to be filled with the Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit fills us, really amazing things happen to our lives and to the lives of those around us. What happened? Well, let, let's just look at Acts chapter 4. As I was reading that, when I started out uh, preaching this morning and I, and I read the text of Acts chapter 4, believers in one heart and mind, no one claimed anything, they all shared. There was, well, didn't you have just, just this deep sense, this deep sense of peace and joy and generosity and kindness? Well, that stuff should sound familiar. 
What are they? They're the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's described in Galatians 5. We talk about this from time to time. Go home and read that and underline it. It's a product of relationship to God. The Holy Spirit is given. We're connected. And what happens to us is that God gives us these spiritual, these spiritual fruits happen. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. When we're filled by the Holy Spirit, there is transformation. People feel different and they act different. They act different in amazing ways. They start worrying less. You don't give stuff away if you're worried. <laughs> they also stepped into the power of God, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, as they believed the truth. Hey, we're connected to God. We have the Holy Spirit. They stepped out in prayer and amazing things started to happen. Having the Holy Spirit working in them made them bold. All of this made them realize that they had some really good news. They could see God at work in their lives and in the lives of the people around them and were looking through them. They realized they had good news, that it was true, and they couldn't keep it to themselves. They had to start giving it away. Being one in heart and mind in Acts 4, they were filled with the Holy Spirit, filled. And secondly and lastly, where we're going to end today, is they had fellowship. And I want to, I want to talk about this because I want you to understand something very practical this morning. Very practical to take with you. If you haven't already gotten anything from me this morning, I want to give you this last piece of practicality. See, I believe that there are a lot of Christians that confuse fellowship with friendship. You can ask a Christian, hey, do you have Christian fellowship? And they might say something like this, yeah, I go to a, I go to a good church and I have a couple of really good Christian friends. Fellowship is different than friendship. If we simply believe, believe that we need a good church and have a few Christian friends and that that's what God means by fellowship, we're going to miss out on the fullness of what God wants for us and we will potentially be suffering alone. And if we miss out on the fullness that God has for us and if we suffer alone, we're going to start blaming God for things that God is not, is not on God's, uh, that, are, that aren't assigned to God. So what is Fellowship talked about this before, I believe, but the Greek term here used is koinonia. Koinonia. And it literally means partnership, unity, togetherness. It means communion. In particular, it refers to that fellowship, the koinonia with God and with one another, being of one heart and in one mind. It appears about 20 times, 18 or 19 times or something like that in the New Testament. But here's what's interesting. The very first time that you see the word koinonia appear, guess where it is? Acts chapter 2. The very first time that we see the word koinonia, unity, togetherness, communion with one another, with God, appears in Acts chapter 2. Why is that significant? What happened in Acts chapter 2? The outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Are you with me? The Holy Spirit is poured out on believers. Koinonia is a work of the Holy Spirit. This isn't about, hey, I go to a church and I got some good friends. What God wants in our fellowship is that we're just simply bound together as Christian believers. I might not really enjoy that person that much. That doesn't matter. It's not about a friendship. It's a, I don't really like what they like necessarily. That doesn't matter. It's about being bound together. And because I'm bound to, to each of you, I'm literally united. I have koinonia with you. We interact in such a way that I'm going to bear your burdens and celebrate your joys, and you'll do the same for me. Amen? It's a movement of the spirit, not a decision of the mind based on how much we have in common. Koinonia is a supernatural grace that causes Christians to love each other deeply. It's not possible before Pentecost because it is a manifestation of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And just as dunamis, remember that a couple of weeks ago, the dynamite power that, that heals the sick, that works miracles, that creates bold followers of Jesus, remember the dunamis, the dynamite power of God? The koinonia of God knits our hearts together and binds us as one. The unity that God works in the disciples then and now allows us to share with each other our joys and our sorrows. It literally unites us so that when one of us is hurting, we all hurt. And so listen to me. If you think that you've got fellowship because you go to a church and you've got a few, few Christian friends, you're missing out on the deep fellowship that God wants for you. Because God wants you, whatever you're going through. I know, I know that every family comes here and they look like everything is great. 
When you look around and you look at other families, you go, man, all these other families are, are really doing well. And then we go home and we go, what's wrong with our family? There is no functional family because a family is a group of sinners gathered together, placed We need each other. We need to be real. We need to have koinonia. So that you're not suffering alone. Amen? So that you're not struggling under a burden alone. If you've got a sin that you're struggling under, God doesn't want you alone. The devil does. The devil wants you to believe that koinonia is just that you've got a good friend over there that if at some point, if you ever said anything to them, they'd meet your needs. But you're never going to because you're too worried about what they'll think. That is not koinonia. I go to a church and I hear some words and I go home and I feel empty. That is not koinonia. The fellowship that God desires for you this morning is unity with Him and with each other so that we ache and we hurt and we suffer and we battle and we rejoice together in Jesus' name. You might have come here today alone, but you're not leaving here alone. God is with you. By the power of the Holy Spirit, He has united you, grafted you into the vine. You might have come here alone, but you're not leaving here alone. Because we are together. There is no untying the believers of God. You can't untie the Holy Spirit. That's God's work, not yours. Of one mind and of one heart. And when we step into that, when we see it and we know it and we claim it and we trust it, God is going to move and transform you, your families, this church, our community, and the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, continue to teach us what it means that we have been united to you and to each other. Father, I pray that you would speak into our lives the truth of what that means. That we don't just read those words or hear those words and let it go in one ear and out the other, but that we dwell on those words. That we are one in heart and mind through you, to you and to each other. Lord, teach us what that means. That we might be a fellowship of believers, trusting in you and loving each other. We ask this in your holy name. And all God's people say...